And he looked at our shoulders and said, Australia, Australia. He says, hey, gay, what branch of the Marine Corps is that? We hit New York. Wow, you wouldn't believe it, the reception we got. Contact mines, magnetic mines, and mean mines that used to lie in the bottom and you could pass over them for a period of time and then boom, up they go. And my arm was over the back seat and we hit <coughs> like that and that arm was, the bone was just popped. And the, when I got out, when I finally got out of the thing, the arm was just swinging like that. It's, it's just so nice and the warmth that I have that it is generated with this. You've seen it, it's, the chemistry is pretty strong. Uh, it's not just for show. <laughs> uh, so Mr. Mulford, I, I hope I can call you Bob, if you don't mind. Uh, welcome and thank you for speaking with us today. When we first found out of your story and that you were so close to Washington DC, we had to get you on camera just to hear what an amazing life and experience that you've had. Uh, turning 99 last week, an absolute feat and achievement. Um, I, I invite you to, to tell our audience what you've been through your entire life, uh, where, where you were born and what led you into uh, combat during World War II and then uh, a little bit about your family, your background and some stories that you can share the young soldiers, airmen, and sailors that are watching, uh, wanting to understand how someone like yourself has been through some terrible times during World War II and then was able to make a life and a career and, and have a loving family at the back end of such a horrific time. So the, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you very much for speaking with us today. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And one thing before I start, I want, want you to realise that BS baffles brains. So uh, with that thought in mind, let's all continue with this. My name's Robert Milford. I was uh, uh, born in Sydney, which uh, uh, my mother and father uh, had migrated of all places to New Zealand. And uh, then my mother, when she found out she, she was having a baby, decided, well, we don't want it to be <laughs> in New Zealanders, so they hurried back to Australia. And uh, this is an interesting thing. Uh, in those days, you were born in a, in a house. And I was born in this house, number eight, Hannon Street, Maroubra. And uh, I, uh, I, 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 I was out, when I was in Australia uh, last time, I decided, in 17, I, I decided it'd be nice to go out and look at the old house again. Well, you wouldn't believe it. Uh, six weeks before, it would have been okay. But it had been torn down, and, and uh, of all things, uh, apartments were being built there. But uh, I hadn't seen it before. But uh, anyway, uh, that's where I was born. And I, I uh, depressions came, came on, and my father uh, finished up... Uh, getting a job in, in, uh, in a, in a gar garage in Pittsworth in, in, uh, in Queensland. So we all moved up to Queensland and uh, from that point on I became a Queenslander. I, I went to primary school there and in, in the town of Pittsworth uh, and uh, after finishing grade 8 I went off to Gatton Agricultural College and uh, that set me on a rather interesting career in, in agriculture, which uh, I, I uh, finished up getting a PhD in the whole thing. When we uh, uh, were in Pittsworth, it was uh, a very, very quiet country town with no, the nearest town of any size was Toowoomba, and, and uh, in the wet weather it was, it, it couldn't be, accessed by, by car because there was no, no road, just a black soil track. So, uh, but the rail motor ran in every day, so 
My mother used to go in that place and shop twice a year uh, in the big stores, <laughs> the big stores in Toowoomba. Well, well, anyway, uh, uh, after going to uh, uh, let's shoot forward to the Ag, Ag College, uh, uh, it was at, at a time when uh, I think in, in 1940, when my diploma year there, my final year, I was uh, I was 17, and uh, uh, war broke out. I, I can remember us all sort of sitting around in the common room saying, oh my God, what are we going to do, you know, we, it's, it's on and, uh, and one of us, I think we all wanted to be ambulance drivers and take the wounded and look after them. Uh, but uh, as time went on, things went a bit different. I, I, uh, when I turned 18, I was working what was then CSIR, I was just a humble field assistant there. And uh, well, that's another story of, of, uh, of my involvement in the CSRO. Uh, when I turned 18, I, uh, I thought, well, it's, it's, I, I just wanted to uh, join the Air Force. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, it was new and, and the, the uh, Commonwealth Air Training Scheme, uh, which that was an interesting thing in itself, the history of that was that uh, uh, the, 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 in Britain, they were fighting for their existence, and uh, and they they just didn't have the resources or the yes, really the resources and area and and and, and um, manpower to to train uh, their their air crews. So uh, that's when Canada stepped in and said, "Well, look, uh, we can." Uh, we can we can do something, and that was the the birth of the the uh, what they called then the Empire or Commonwealth Flying Training Scheme, of which Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and and other co other uh, Commonwealth countries, and and in those days uh, um, colonies of the British Empire. Uh, became part, but it was those three that were the principal ones. So that's a sort of a background of where I came in into this whole thing and deciding that I would very much like to be in, in, in the Air Force. So, so I remember I was working at the Agricultural College and uh, I went up to Pittsworth and I said, well, look, I want to, want to join the Air Force. Uh, so my mother was went into orbit a bit, and she said, "Well, she said you can you you can join the air force, but I want you to be a wireless operator, like the uh, like the doctor's son down the street, uh, uh, Doctor Bridgman's son, and uh, he was a ground a wireless operator, but a ground operator. So she reckoned that I'd be safer safer on the ground. Okay, step forward." Uh, the day I, I, I joined the Air Force and uh, it was at the recruiting centre in Creek Street in Brisbane. Uh, my father came down because I was only 18 and uh, he had to sign the permission and the paper that, and so forth. So he waited out on the footpath for me and in I went. Uh, so they put me through all these places and, and uh, uh, you know the the the, the giggle tests and and the the uh, physical and so forth so forth and uh, and uh, I said well you know I uh, uh, I'd like to be a well I, 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 actually I I I applied to I, in recruitment I said I want to be a wireless operator well anyway I did all the tests and then so the last one was a handwriting test. And I said, you can't be a wireless operator. You can't, we can't read your writing. And I thought to myself, thank God for that. And, and uh, so I go out onto the, onto the footpath, and my father's there. And I said, Dad, they won't take me for wireless operator. But I said, they'll take me for air crew. So he looked at it, and he signed it. He says, don't tell your mother. So, so that's how I, I finished up an air crew. Okay. 
Uh, so we go there, uh, and Sandgate in, outside Brisbane was the, the two two months of, of uh, initial training, square bashing, and and all the courses in Morse code and and mathematics and 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 you know all that basic stuff. Well, it so happened that Bob was one of the few people that had actually been to his education had been, been through high school with the kids then were mostly they left school at 13 so I had a big advantage over most of them in the course and uh, and uh, when after two months we had these exams and uh, and Bob happened to ace the whole Brimbon thing you see and so oh this was very good and I said I thought to myself well th then you had to face the selection board Okay, well, I'll go to the selection board. Well, they would never have me as a pilot. I couldn't even drive a car, and uh, I could drive a tractor. Uh, and uh, they, uh, uh, but um, I was sort of recognised too young too. So they, 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 they probably had me as a navigator, and the navigators were paid more than the than the gun, rear gun, you know, than air gunners or, or wireless operators. Not as much as pilots, but I mean, it's a matter of pay too, you know. And so I said, well, I wanted to, uh, they asked me what I'd like to, to be, and I said, a navigator. And the guy looked and he looked at the paper. Oh, he said, you were a bit weak in your, in your maths. And I said, what? And uh, he said, well, you only got 95%. <laughs> and so, so he said, "You're weak." So, oh God. So, so the next thing I know, uh, I was made a wireless operator. But it so happened that all the course, except two or three guys that they reckon were medically unfit to be a wireless operator, I don't know how. Uh, we all were sent up to Maribor the whole damn course, and 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 of course. There was a reason for this because uh, uh, the the bomber command in in the UK were just uh, were just starting to flex their muscles and and and, and you know thinking about uh, the, their needs in the future. They they really needed uh, aircrew of all sorts, but the, their main thing main thought was uh, was gunners and and uh, being a wireless air gunner. Uh, that was how it, I, that was my take on the whole thing. Uh, we, we, uh, that's how we finished up in that. Well, I went up to Maribor training there and I was rather ticked off, you know, I really was. This is, this is crazy. But at any rate, uh, after a few, you know, going into the, uh, a, uh, the course there, well, it wasn't too bad at all, particularly the Morse code. And, and uh, I was a natural for the damn thing. Or well, sp different speeds. Huh? So I think they started at 10 words a minute and went up 12 words, 16 words, and 18 words, different huts. And you had to you know, go there every day. Well, it finished up that, uh, that I just went straight through these things in, in a matter of a, of a week or two. And we were going to be there for six months. So. Instructors were all mostly from the post office, you know, telegraph, and they used to get me in the corner and send. They got bored too with all this business, with the having to go slow, and they took me into the corner. And I was at that stage, I was doing about 38, 40 words a minute on the on the damn thing. So I, I liked that, and uh, so that's 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 me as a wireless operator. Well, we graduated, uh, and. Uh, in Maribor, and then we had to go down to uh, to uh, Evans Head uh, in Northern New South Wales for the gunnery course. Uh, and I'll never forget this. We we in 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 the the, the one every year that you know there were flights, and, and our flight sergeant uh, Curly Brewer, and Curly was a rough woman drill master and he was rough on us too. And uh, he took us down there and uh, he handed us over to the authorities there 
and he had tears in his eyes. He knew what was ahead of us. And uh, so, so uh, I did the, the gunnery course, and I must confess that I was a lousy bloody air gunner. I couldn't shoot nothing for nothing. <laughs> and, uh, and we, but we had these bloody Vickers guns and we used to, and, and, and fairy battles, and we had to stand up and hold the damn thing like that and shoot at a drogue. Well, I, I was no good at that. I think I'd have been all right in the turret because uh, actually I wasn't too bad when we found out how you do, how air gunner really worked. But uh, anyway, I finished up the wireless operator. And uh, so the next thing that happened, we were, we, we all had our sides and stripes and, and some of them even were made officers, uh, not this one. And uh, we were finished up in, in Flemington race course uh, waiting for a ship to go back to, to, to ship us off. And uh, we, uh, I'll never forget this, it was, it was an American, uh, U, uh, SS America I think was the name of the ship. It was an American passenger ship which had been converted for, for the uh, military use. And uh, we, we uh, about a thousand of us, they stuck us on that, but there was a, also a thousand of all wounded from Guadalcanal, the American Marines. And, uh, and that was quite an experience, our first real contact with combat American forces. Uh, and uh, I'll never forget driving, uh, sailing into, uh, uh, into, into San Francisco Harbor and, and uh, uh, this Ameri the Marine guy was alongside me and he's, he's, he's having a dig at me and I said, see that place over there? And it was uh, Alcatraz. And I said, that's where they recruited the Marines from. <laughs> and he sort of <laughs> anyway, that was all the driving. Well, okay, off we get on this thing and the whole thing as I said, about a thousand of us, they put on this damn big long train uh, to trundle us across the US of A. And none of us, you know, this was quite something. And, and uh, uh, we, we, uh, the trains had to stop to get water and coal and everything in those days. Uh, and they'd pull up and uh, at a stop. And I remember Kansas City was one. And, uh, and then we'd get off the train and they'd never get us back on again. We just hit the town and away we go. And I, I, I remember this guy, we, we were walking down, about four of us walking down the, the street and yakking away, and uh, this guy pulled us up. And he said, and he looked at our shoulders and said, Australia, Australia. He says, hey, gay, what branch of the Marine Corps is that? So, so, yeah. So anyway, well, away we went, and uh, uh, we we were we were, were finished up at, uh, at a place called Taunton, which is south of uh, of uh, Boston, and uh, at uh, uh, and, and away at, at Camp Miles Standish, which was the the, the uh, staging camp for the American Army. You know, they were sent by that time, you know things were happening and those the American uh, uh, forces uh, were, 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 that's where they went and then they finally were shipped off from there. Well, we were in that, that mob and uh, we were there for, ooh, I can, can't remember exactly, but it was six weeks, two months and, uh, and we were a bit rambunctious and they, they, the Americans were getting rather pissed off with us and, and uh, and so it was decided that, uh, that they would uh, give, they'd split us into three groups and they'd give us a, a week in New York. Well, uh, when our turn came about, I remember this, that we were lined up in ranks of three and, and uh, the, the, uh, the officer is uh, running the blooming flight, had to, had to uh, 
it made, made, make sure that we all had 20 bucks to go to, to New York. If he didn't have 20 bucks, bad luck, he couldn't go. So anyway, that 20 bucks went down the line and back and everything else. <laughs> so everybody had their $20, you see. And uh, I had 15, I might add. Uh, and uh, so, so uh, we hit New York. Wow, you wouldn't believe it, the reception we got. And, and, uh, <laughs> and the, the, uh, <laughs> the, the we, we went to, I remember our mob, we went to Jack Dempsey's and Jack Dempsey came out and sat with us and brought us one of his, we had a drink with him and so forth. And, uh, and we went to the stage door canteen and, uh, and uh, we were freighted there and, uh, uh, and the Rockettes. We, we were given front row seats at the Rockettes and uh, that, was, that was really, really wonderful. We got back uh, to Miles Standish and... Uh, well, I might just add another thing there about the Miles Standish thing. When we got off there, there was about uh, a foot of snow on the ground and uh, none of us, we hadn't seen snow in our lives, most of us. And uh, I remember, and, and our clothing, our great coats, they weren't very great, I can tell you, in that damp climate. And, and we had to march about a mile from the, from the railway siding up to the barracks. And uh, uh, I, I, can, I, I can remember that. And, and it was, fortunately, we had gloves. I remember with this strong wind blowing, and I had to, I held my hand to my ear uh, uh, because of just the cold. And there were guys that didn't do that, and they got badly frostbitten ears. And one guy actually had to had to have his ear amputated. Was it was, you know, ignorance of the climate. Yeah. So so okay, we we step back and we. We're now going back, we, we're on our way to England. We, they shipped us down to New York and we took the, uh, <coughs> the Queen Elizabeth uh, uh, on our way to the battle zone, you know, and all that. And um, uh, the, it was, uh, the ship was compartmentalized, I think in four sections. Uh, the, the, you're in the section, there were bunks of four, I don't know. There were many thousands of troops on that on that boat. I know there were Canadians and and Americans and and, and our contingent. And and uh, the the, the uh, it was rather an uncomfortable vis uh, trip. It took about five or six days. Went up as a rum line up to the Arctic Circle and went back down to Scotland, Glasgow, and. Uh, it was most uncomfortable because it was, it was the U-boats were always after that boat, and and fortunately the our our, our speed they and they were flat out all the time, 32 knots, and could outrun a torpedo, and, uh, and but they changed course about every, I think every every minute or so. But the boat was con constantly, so if you if you didn't have sea legs, you soon got them, uh, and. Uh, so we finally landed in Scotland, and back we go, then they shipped us down to the what was then the Australian Air Crew Assembly Centre in Bournemouth, and uh, it was there that uh, we we <laughs> there were some funny things there too. The the uh, I remember that uh, what was that Judy Garland uh, yeah. Wizard of Oz, yeah, and that was in the local cinema, and, and uh, the the. Uh, the Bournemouth is a rather hilly place, and they'd march along there, and, and they'd, they, we, had, we had huts for, for learning about poison gas and about Morse code and all these things, and they used to march us around from one to the other, and the officer in front leading this mob, and uh, the bus used to go by, and we'd hop on the bus. And, and th there was one case where I remember the, the, the officer was marching like that and there was no one behind him. <laughs> it was complete. <laughs> so we'd, get, we'd sneak off and go to, the, go to the cinema and watch a picture or something. Yes, but uh, anyway, the, uh, every Sunday they had a posting parade. Our, our group 
uh, uh, wireless upgrades. I, I went up to Scotland and I just don't remember the place. Now it was south of Glasgow, and they had a uh, they had this uh, sort of initial introduction into the equipment because the equipment we trained on in Australia was obsolete, and uh, so we were we were uh, trained there. We got to OTU, Operational Training, that's where we got crewed up. It was very interesting the way they, they formed the crews there. Uh, we, we were a five-man crew in, the, in Wellington, uh, and this was what we, we did our OTU on. And, and uh, they put us in a room, and you just went around, and, and uh, you formed a crew. Uh, well, I, I like the look of this guy, Jimmy, and he found out Jimmy James, and he was finished up being the bomb aim and we wandered around and he was, this, he was an Englishman, this Australian guy, pretty old looking fella too. Old, he was, I was, I was uh, 20 by then, 19, 20, and, and he was 28, he was an old man. And uh, so I said good day to him and he said good day to me and uh, so that's what I had, and uh, and then we needed a a, uh, a navigator, and and this officer fellow came along, and uh, he didn't look too bad, even if he was an officer. So so uh, so Dusty Tithridge turned out to be a damn good navigator, and then we had to get a gunner, and so so uh, we went around and we got this Irishman. Uh, and uh, then when he found out that uh, we were not likely to be staying in England, we are going to go to, the, to North Africa, uh, he, he didn't uh, think that was good. So he got out and then we finished up with Billy, Billy Kilmister, there was a, another Englishman, and a damn, damn good gunner. Matter of fact, if it, I wouldn't be here talking to you if it hadn't been for that guy in the back. Uh, so, uh, anyway, uh, so, so that was that, and off we go. We did our, 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 uh, our OTU training, and, uh, and we were supposed to, we had this airplane to fly out to, uh, to North Africa and eventually over to Algeria, uh, to, to Tunisia, uh, and, and um, at the last minute, they, they, they decided that uh, we couldn't, they didn't, we, we, we had to go on, on, on a boat. We, they, they ferried us out in this convoy, and the ship we were on happened to be uh, the SS Champollion. It was a French ferry boat, and, and uh, it got rather, matter of fact, we were rather worried about it going across the Bay, Bay of Biscay because uh, it didn't seem to be too, too, too worthy at all, or seaworthy, but we made it, and uh, uh, it was, we were in a convoy, and we, we got across to, uh, through, through, through the Straits of Gibraltar, and uh, then, then the, the, uh, the naval escort were flicking away, and, uh, and, and we, the, we were very popular then, the wireless operators, because we were reading what the messages they were sending, and uh, they they weren't very uh, uh, sort of encouraging. They 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 were saying that you back you boat packs were waiting and around there, be careful and that. So so oh no, we we, we there was nothing that happened. But we we they put us ashore, this place called Philipville, in 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 Algeria, and uh, it was. No one expected us or anything. They just dumped us there, and so we're on the and, and we're on the sand in the in the sand dune on the seashore. The officers again had a nice quarter somewhere, and uh, but we we camped there for a oh, week or so, uh, and and you'd put your ground sheet down, and stick your kit bag up there and sleep there at night. Lift the ground sheet up and it'd be swarming with scorpions, and swarming, absolutely, and then they'd burrow into sand. 
And then one of the one of the uh, Australian air crew guys, uh, sergeants, he started to open a book, and he opened a book on a, on on scorpion races, and uh, it was the one that got the furthest before it burrowed down in the sand. <laughs> he got the odds on that. <laughs> well, well, anyway, they put us on this this uh, these trains, and, and uh, you know, you, you've seen these these. Uh, the trains, uh, when if you've ever been to the Holocaust Museum, it's the same, the same car, uh, carriage, you know, uh, things. And uh, uh, they, when we got there, the sliding doors, and and they had 32, uh, no, eight, uh, nine horses or ten horses, and and 32 homes, and and so. There were more than 32 of us in one of those things, and and there'd been horses in the damn box we were in before, and I hadn't cleaned it out. So we, we, there we were in that damn thing, and we had to sleep head to toe, head to toe, and then at the night, if you if you felt the urge to had to go out and and while the train was trundling along, you had to go out and have a pee out the side. Well. You had to step over all these guys if you happened to be down the end. And the language was awful. We, we got to Tunisia uh, and, and uh, then they allocated us to, to a squadron. And uh, I was, I was uh, sent to 150 Squadron RAF with our crew. And we, we were sent right down to the southern Tunisia, a place called Karouan, which was a holy city, but it was in the desert. And uh, and we got uh, we got there, uh, and uh, it had one of those rainfalls like they had in Western New South Wales just recently, rare but uh, vicious, and the place was flooded out. Uh, so we didn't do any operation flying from there, and we we uh, they moved us up to to northern uh, Tunisia near the coast. And uh, by that time, the S Sicily had been taken, and the the uh, U uh, British Eighth Army and the American Army were were uh, had landed in Italy and they were fighting their way up, and so uh, we <coughs> we did a couple of operations from that part uh, and and uh, of, of, of Algeria. Uh, uh, sorry, Tunisia, and and then uh, uh, very shortly afterwards, the the uh, Eighth Army took the what what uh, was a prize really the around the Foggia area of Italy, which is on the on the eastern side of, of the of the coast of Italy, but about parallel to, to uh, Naples, uh, and, and uh, that's where. Uh, the, the RAF, the uh, Germans had some magnificent airfields there, so we were able to take that, take over those. As it turned out, when we when we got down to the down to Tunisia, uh, well, this is a story that goes around. They 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 urgently uh, sent a, a cable to to England. They wanted a hundred air screws. And so we were the hundred air crew <laughs> that finished up there, <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, that's a good story. I don't know how true it is, but but we thought it was pretty good. So <laughs> I don't know who was screwed at the whole thing, but I think eventually they were expecting the crews to be screwed, if you get my drift. And so so anyway, as I say, we we uh, we moved over to Italy. And uh, from there, uh, that's where our real adventure started. And uh, uh, we we uh, we did actually our operations in Italy were were sort of divided into two two compartments, if you like. There was the the, the our our raids in in um, on 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 in Italy itself. Were, 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 you could say were mainly uh, uh, tactical, in the sense that uh, most of them were 
to support what the what the American and and uh, and, and British forces were were doing, you know, on the ground, uh, and uh, and you know, mainly transport, you know, railheads and roads and and that sort of stuff. But the 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 more interesting and and rather rather more dangerous stuff was uh, it was further further east in 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 uh, in Romania and and Hungary and and uh, southern Germany and Austria and uh, was there that, uh, that 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 our group which was it was a small group we were one or five uh, a two or five group was a was a uh, was a night bomber group attached to the uh, worked in, in conjunction with the 15th American Air Force, which was a much larger force, and, and a lot of our, our our stuff there again was was to uh, go up at night sometimes and and. And, and sort of soften up the airfields that where the fighters were coming up for the for the, uh, the the American day bombers. Of course, we got the damn fighters coming up at us as a much smaller force too. Uh, and and but the as I was saying, our most our, our targets there were very 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 interesting because uh, uh, it, it it all tied in with oil. With, with the production of, 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 of oil uh, and uh, with the Ploesti oil fields uh, were, the, were the main source of the, the Germans had for their, for their high-grade gasoline. Uh, they they, uh, they uh, didn't, of uh, uh, course, from their potatoes and that, they could make, they could make uh, alcohol enough to drive their cars and that sort of thing, but for the Luftwaffe, they, they they needed this stuff, so so our our mission was to to stop this as as best as we could, and that was divided into into uh, uh, store uh, product uh, you know, the production uh, storage and, and and transport of this stuff, and uh, the the on the production side uh, the, the the it was. Just one place, the uh, Ploesti oil fields, uh, and uh, our night force was pretty small, and that was the second next to the Ruhr. It was the second most next most heavily defended target in the place. So you could it was pretty bloody awful to go there at night uh, with. Uh, no, in 60 or 70, I said, what the hell can we do, you know, with a few bombs we drop? And uh, uh, you, the flak was so thick, you could just put your wheels down and taxi over it. Well, well uh, uh, after they found that our loss rate was so high, and it was way above the 5%, it was about 8%, some of those trips that, uh, that, that they... Really, we, we were more then on the on the uh, storage and transport stuff, and on the storage, most of the storage was done on on the river, on the Danube, and the Danube flowed from east to west, and then took a turn and goes up north into Germany, Hungary, or Germany and Austria. Did did do some raids on the on the uh, the storage that they that uh, they they uh, they had on the river, which down down in the southern part, but uh, most of it was was uh, on the barges. Now a barge uh, uh, carrying carrying fuel on the river could carry as much as a whole freight train. And so, so they were very, very keen to keep that going. Well, this is where, where I think that uh, our, our little group made a very significant uh, contribution to shortening the war. Uh, and and some, of, some of the uh, pundits have reckoned it may be by as much as six months because uh, we, we uh, went in mainly at moonlight nights 
and, and mined the Danube River. And, and the mines were, were, uh, were of, of sorted types, contact mines, magnetic mines, and mean mines that used to lie in the bottom and you could pass over them for a period of time and then boom, up they go. And our, our, uh, our, our armourers, squadron armourers, were, uh, were not allowed to, uh, to uh, touch these things. They all had to be done in secret, if you like, by, by the Navy armourers. So, you know, it was, it was quite, a, quite a deal. And that, that definitely had quite an impact on, on, on the transport of, of, uh, of gasoline, of, <coughs> you know, gear, uh, fuel up on the Danube River was their main source. And, and it was uh, on the sideline there, the crews of the barges were mainly Czechoslovakians. And, uh, and these guys, when, they st when the barges started blowing up, they just hit, they hit the mountains and they weren't going to crew any damn thing. So, so the Germans had, had a couple of problems there. They, they had them blowing up and then the, no crews would, were, were going to take any up there in any case. And uh, they did try to, uh, to sweep the river or they had these great big junkers, 52s I think they were with, with great iron rings, degaussing rings underneath them to fly over the things. But I think a few of those got blown up too and they had to fly low over the river to try and neutralize these damn mines. But anyway, uh, the, the uh, whole upshot of that effort was, uh, was very, very significant. Very significant indeed. I, I've talked generally about, about the flying there, but I haven't mentioned anything about our individual crew, how we, uh, things happened there. But I did mention that uh, when, when we were crewed up, how, how critical it was to have the rear gunner that we had. And, and, and I'd just like to cite this one particular incident uh, that uh, I thought was, it's, it's a very, pertin very pertinent to the whole thing, that uh, this was, we were on a, I think we were on two uh, Milan marshalling guards up in, uh, up in northern Italy. And uh, there was a, you know, a lot of flak and goodness knows what. And uh, when, when we were over enemy territory, the wireless operator's job was to get into the Astrodome and keep, keep a fighter watch. And, uh, and uh, sometimes if it was a long period, I'd have to go back for every 15 minutes and just in case there was any messages that uh, we might get an early return, for example. Uh, but uh, anyway, I was in the Astrodome and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, th 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 there was a, a, a German fighter, a Fock Wolf. No, it was, it was a Messerschmitt. And, and it, uh, it came up, it was attacking something underneath us. And, and but it, it obviously they took evasive action and, and the, the, when you turn into the, into the curve of pursuit, the Germans had to, you know, the fighter came in on a curve and you turned into that curve and he couldn't, couldn't bank sharply enough, so he had to break off. And uh, he broke off and there was this damn thing hanging in the searchlights, stalled, wait, you know, he, he stalled up and, and I'm screaming to Billy, the gunner, get the bastard, get the bastard. And Billy said he hadn't seen us yet, and and that was very true because once you fire your guns, your tracer is everywhere, and it gives you position away. So so uh, I think that's uh, that's well worth recounting. And uh, uh, on the the uh, other part of it, uh, you know, as a as a crew, uh, we uh, we flew well the the. The tour for us was 40, uh, and Bomber Command in England was 30. And they reckon that uh, with Bomber Command, their casualty rate was about 5% per trip. And so when you got to 20, you were on borrowed time. And uh, in our case, our casualty rate was about three and a third. So once we got to 30, 
trips. Uh, we were on borrowed time, so we were doing the, the 40. Well, as it turned out, the pilot uh, had to do two uh, uh, trips before he took his own crew out. And so we, as the crew, we did 38 and the pilot did, our pilot uh, did 40. So, so uh, uh, we, we survived all that. And, and, and uh, some very interesting happenings, I'll show you the one about Billy. Uh, on, on, a, on another occasion, uh, we were over Romania and we, we, we did the, uh, did the, um, uh, the, the, the run to Ploest, the uh, Bucharest area. And we weren't very happy about it all, but we got out of that. And and uh, I remember we had a, a spare before going into the place. We had a had a uh, a, uh, a spare bod uh, bomb aimer, and and uh, he was a RAF sergeant with a DFM. And when you see a sergeant in those days with a DFM. You got to reckon with well, that guy. He he he's got more more guts and brains uh, <laughs> to, to get this the death or glory. So anyway, I, I can remember that going in on that target, and 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 the bombing run was just on and on and on and on, and here we are, bang bang bang, and uh, finally he got out of this thing, and uh, oh, did I heave a sigh of relief, and coming back. Then, down at all, there was a, a huge, uh, one of the Pathfinder uh, Halifaxes blew up. She said, this is, I wasn't feeling very happy. And, and uh, we're, we're on our way back, halfway, about halfway on, on, uh, back on, over uh, enemy territory. And, and uh, all of a sudden, there's, there's uh, Billy, the gun that screams out that there's a, there's a fuck wolf one on our, uh, and then I was in the Astrodome and I looked out on the starboard side. There was a fuck wolf 190 there. On the other side, there was a fuck wolf 190. Holy hell! What's going to? Yeah, you know, we're we're goners, and uh, so so uh, we so we stooge along for a little bit, and they stooge along, and so so Billy. The gunner, he just poured a burst into the one behind, and uh, these guys broke up. They broke away, and so, and I used to tell this story. I could never figure this out until just a few years ago. I I, I had this book and I, I read about the 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 uh, Romanians in the war. You see, uh, the Romanians first thing that well. There are two things. Uh, the the only country that uh, uh, that the Germans were permitted of their of their countries they they'd taken uh, to to build an air build aircraft was Romania, and uh, so they built a, an aircraft which was similar to the 190, but it wasn't the 190. It was a Romanian thing, and. Uh, and the other thing was that uh, at about the time that uh, that we did that up, uh, the the uh, Romania had changed sides. The Russians were coming, and and so uh, they changed sides, and they were on our side. So these guys were playing with us. <laughs> so thank God for that. <laughs> we got out of that one. But uh, yeah, that was. Uh, Touch and go on a few other occasions, but uh, but the uh, all in all, we made it. And as I said, uh, with the chopper rate as it was, you 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 were always for flying that last few. You're flying on borrowed time, but there's one thing about it that uh, that um, certainly uh, was was on our side that we were a crew. And once you got through, I, we always, from our experience, about the first 10 trips, if you could get through that first 10 trips, uh, the crews were pretty wised up and, and your chances of, 
of, of getting knocked down were, was, were reduced. And the main thing for that was the flak. You seem to, you, you, of course, you couldn't do anything about the flak. But with the fighters, you 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 know you learn to detect them and to take the right evasive action and so forth. So you learn as a team. And and, and uh, I, 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 in that book there, I've got left there. Uh, one thing I wanted to say was that you know they asked you if you're frightened. Of course, I was shit scared. Uh, but. Uh, you, you you never let that, you kept the lid on it uh, because, you know, you were part of the crew. You weren't going to let anybody down. And the one thing it did do was to bump, pump up the, the adrenaline so, you, you know, you were, you, were, you, you were able to act as a, you know, as a real cog in the wheel of the crew. Having, having uh, survived all that, uh, we eventually finished our tour, and uh, damn me, by that time, it was just at the time when we finished, when Rome, Rome fell, but was out of bounds. And uh, so, so, oh God, that's good. So, but we had a, we had a wonderful leave camp a midway through our mid-tour in, in Italy there. We, they, they took over one of these hostels in, in, uh, in Sorrento which incidentally is still there and it takes people, you know, it's a high, high tourist run now. It's the same one. And, and um, uh, before the, the RAF took it over, the Luftwaffe had it. So it's their, it's their rest camp too. Uh, but at any rate, uh, uh, that was a mid-tour thing. And uh, we went out on a, on a, around the nightclubs there and it happened to be fi filled with the British, the British 78th Division, and uh, uh, just, just four of us. And uh, we went into this nightclub and we went out quickly, but not quickly enough, and they came out in force <laughs> and attacked us. I got a great boot in the face. <laughs> just lost me teeth. So, yeah, that's a byline, but it's worth telling. Uh, but, uh, uh, we we uh, get down. We went back to England, uh, and uh, from then on, uh, it was it, you know, pretty. All, all I did there, they they sent me to. Uh, well, first of all, when when you when you finished the air crews finished their tour, uh, they had a place up in in uh, in Scotland uh, that uh, they 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 took all the the. Uh, uh, the tour expired uh, air crew up there of all, you know, the coastal, everybody, coastal command and bomber command and everything else. And, and uh, I can't remember the name of the town now, but uh, we'd go in there and they reckoned we were, we were mad. I mean, because we were just, we were mad. We were flak happy and, and uh, so, so pleased to be, be, be still alive that, uh, yeah. And, uh, uh, I can remember us going into uh, in rationing it was 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 very tight in England and going to into a restaurant the three of us that stuck together and you question there and they were they they were uh, actually all on the one squadron there were three of us that trained together and uh, going into the restaurant and uh, taking our rest our right coats off and putting them on the chair hanging it on the back of the chair putting a cap uh, warrant officers we were then warrant, putting a cap there and we'd start talking to Charlie, uh, Charlie Jorgensen and, uh, and uh, we'd, we'd order four meals, one for Charlie and one for each of us and then we'd get the meals split up between us. <laughs> so, and they, 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 they just reckoned we were quite crazy. I guess we were. But uh, we were pretty damn glad to get out of all that. But. For the rest of the time, though, I was then from that point I was posted down to to Kidlington uh, Airport outside uh, outside uh, Oxford, uh, and and uh, uh, it was um, uh, was very boring actually. That was a pilot's advanced training unit, and we had to those two engine things. We had to uh, we had to. Uh, uh, they had to have a wireless operator in them, so so that was 
that was that. And uh, after about six months there, the war finished and, and we were in, in Europe. And uh, I was, well, Roy, Roy Hall and I had been together all this time and uh, we, somewhere along at, at Kidlington, the, the signals leader said, you guys ought to get a commission. And so, so okay. So we went off and they, there was this bunch of bloody training command Wallace. They'd never seen a bloody gun fired in action, I don't think, and uh, we but to be interviewed. Well, Roy was okay, but I happened to get a recurrence of malaria. And so I wasn't very, <laughs> my performance wasn't very good at all. So Roy got his commission and I didn't. And, uh, oh God, that's all right. So. So the next thing I get a call from the Australian headquarters in, in London, I get to go up there and this guy interviewed me and, uh, and said, well, you know, you can, yeah, sure, you can get it. So the next thing I was a pilot officer and that's what I was discharged as pilot officer Milford. But, uh, but also when we were at, at this very boring place in, in uh, doing this damn flying around, uh, war was coming to an end, but we decided at about time we went on a second tour, Roy and I did. So we, we, we volunteered to, be, to go back, go with Bomber Command on a second tour. And we were called up to RAF, I think it was RAF at any rate, uh, and the uh, wing commander there said, why the hell do you think I'm sitting on this bench, sit, sitting on this desk? He said, I'm sorry, boys. <laughs> He said, there's plenty of guys that haven't done anything, so, so we didn't get our second tour. Just as well, we probably got the chop. So, <laughs> so I'm sitting here telling you these stories and that's that. So that was the end of the war for me. They, we went back to Australia and uh, I, uh, I went back to the Agricultural College uh, and I, and, and I got in and I happened to meet this lovely doll of a lady at a, at a dance and that one thing led to another and in 19, 27th of December 1947 we were married and that was that. Uh, but uh, it was uh, you know, a pretty good journey and, and I went to university and uh, I got my agricultural degree and then I got my masters and uh, I, by that time I was I started off as a cowboy in, in CSIR. It was changed to CSIRO uh, after the war. Uh, I became then a technical officer, then a sen senior technical officer, then an experimental officer. And then when I finished up get, getting my master's degree, I was made, well, by that time I was actually at Gatton at the Cooper Laboratory. We were, we were doing, and I was doing research and digestibility of tropical grasses. Uh, the, uh, we had a, a visit from uh, uh, a, a high-powered uh, group of CIR people, and Sir Ian Clooney's Ross was the, was the, the guy running it. And uh, when he saw the work I was doing, he went back and he said, you know, this guy's just a bloody experimental officer. You know, he's got it. And so uh, one thing led to another, and I, was, I got my research officer. And then uh, my boss, Jack Davies, in Tropical Pastures, he, he said, uh, well, this time Gatton was 60 miles from Brisbane, and he said, Bob, come and pick me up. He'd been down to Melbourne Syro headquarters, and uh, he was going to this conference uh, a grassland conference, an international one, and he, he was going to take me with him. And uh, I went there and he came back and he said, uh, well, Bob, he says, they still won't let you go with me, but he said, I've got a, a, uh, I've got a scholarship for you. You're going to England for two years. You can do your PhD. And I took the whole family with me. And, uh, and that was... Uh, you know, quite a wonderful thing, you see. And in addition, of course, to working at the at the Grassland Research Institute there, and I got my PhD, but was uh, we had 
time to you know, do other things and uh, on this particular occasion Veronica and I were up in London and uh, we were walking down the Strand and here it is, Queensland House. Oh, good Lord, let's go in there. So we go in there and it so happened that the lady behind the counter was the one that, that uh, Veronica knew and Veronica lived in Clayfield in Brisbane and every, every she, she was teaching outside the, at Laidley actually and she used to come in by, by train every weekend and, and she used to go to the, to the Union Jack Club uh, and, and uh, look after the whole thing for the weekend with all these deadbeat women servicemen coming in for a bed and so forth and organising them. Well, this lady, and, and she, she was sort of her boss in this thing and uh, she remembered and, and so when she saw her in London she said, Oh, Veronica! Uh, and she said, what can we do? Well, we're just here. She said, would you like to go to a garden party in the palace? And, uh, well, she said, well, Bob, Bob, you know, he was in the army. She said, no, she said, not him. He, he said, there's ten, 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 you know, there, there's plenty of them around. She said, no, you. So it was on her, on her, her uh, her work as the Union Jack Club that we got to the Garden Palace in. And I remember that one because you had to get a morning suit with a top hat and you know, that sort of thing. Hired this thing and we came out of Buckingham Palace at the gates and the mob was there and I waved to them like Winston Churchill, you know. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, then I went over to this old battered out vanguard that we drove and, and uh, took the suitcase out, went over to the, the public toilets in, in, the, in the garden, in the park there, and changed into my other gear. <laughs> and then, then we went down the street and found a nice Chinese restaurant. We had our dinner and we were, we were going to a show afterwards and, and so it was a bit rushed. And uh, I paid the bill and walking out the street and next thing, this little Chinese man was coming out of me, after me. We hadn't paid our bill, he said. He was upstairs. <laughs> and so we're going from the sublime to ridiculous. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, yeah that, was, that was quite something. OK, uh, get back to, to Australia. And, and I was, uh, uh, you know, my research was pretty, it was worldwide. What you regarded then as, as something quite quite uh, interesting and, and uh, in the field of evaluation of pastures and that, uh, this digestibility work I was doing. So uh, off I went to a, a grassland congress in, uh, international congress in Brazil. As a result of that, uh, you know, I, I was the, and, and the boss couldn't make it actually, and I was, I was our our rep, you know, representative of tropical pastors there, the boss got sick. So uh, I, I had to sort of play this game and we were, by that time, we were way ahead of the rest of the tropical world in this stuff. So, so uh, uh, I did this and then as a result, and after the post uh, 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 conference, uh, the Paraguayan people wanted me to go over there because of climate-wise and everything else. So went to Paraguay and, okay, there was a World Bank uh, uh, ranching project there. And, uh, you know, I made some comments and I think I wrote a little report for them. And that was that. Went back to Australia and very happily working at Gatton again and, uh, and, uh, a few promotions and everything else, and um, uh, and in about that was in '63 and in '68, uh, I I had a cable from the World Bank to say would I be interested in in uh, in this position as a you know, pastor expert or something in technician in this project in in Paraguay. So uh, okay. Uh, not me, I said, nah. But Veronica, even if you knew her, she was dynamite. She was only four foot seven. But she said, yeah, we're going. So we packed up with all the kids, four of them, 
But Bernard was going to uni then, and so he he went back and he he was there. But uh, the three girls were with with us in Paraguay for a couple of years, and uh, the family went back to Australia because the bank World Bank had projects uh, evaluating you know to super uh, to uh, appraise in uh, in Indonesia. And they, they they grabbed me as a consultant, which it turned out they were they looking at me. Uh, and uh, so so I went out there, and uh, they must have liked the look of what I did, and, and they offered me a job, and which I couldn't refuse, really. And uh, so that's how I ended up in America, working in World Bank in, in Washington, D.C., but doing projects all around. Uh, Mostly in, in East Asia, I did work there, and I did a really, really, really good uh, dairy project in India. Very proud of that. And uh, in Latin America, and in the last years of my stuff there, it was uh, mostly in, uh, in, in, in Mexico. And I, I uh, was known there as the Red Kangaroo. Well, I'd like to just just finish up with making a point that uh, right now I'm in my hundredth year. I, I just last week I turned 99, and at the uh, at the uh, retirement place where I, I now live, it was uh, we had quite a party, and uh, and I also just just add the fact that. Uh, I'm rather lucky to be sitting here talking to you. Uh, I did 38 missions and 38 uh, operations in, in the Air Force and survived that. Uh, then in my one of my early adventures with World Bank, in, in, in the, I was on a mission to uh, Uganda and uh, we were flying in a, in a uh, Beechcraft, low, low single engine, and uh, visiting these these villages up in the northeast of Uganda, where the women wear, wore uh, a cowhide on each side, but hadn't been cleaned. They were rather smelly, and the men wear nothing. Uh, and uh, damn me, the uh, aircraft engines seized at uh, about 600 feet, and and. Uh, that's another story. We went in, and fortunately, we crashed, and we didn't burst into flames. But the the, the technician in front was panicked to hell, and uh, I was screaming out to him to get the catch off that door so we could get out quick, if we, you know, before it burst into flames. And my arm was over the back seat, and we hit <coughs> like that, and that arm was the bone was just popped. And when I got out, when I finally got out of the thing, my arm was just swinging like that. And uh, and so uh, I'm lucky to have that arm, but I'm lucky to be alive on that. And then uh, later on in 78, uh, I had a very, very large tumour in the, in the inner ear, and they had to operate on this, and it, and it actually spilled out and was about that far from the spinal column. The, the, the thing, it was benign, of course, but it took 13 hours to dig the thing out. And when I saw the, the guy, the, the hospital uh, guy before I uh, went in for the surgery, he said, you know, Mr. Milford, you said, have you made a will? I said, yep. He said, well, just as well, he said, because you've got about a 10% chance of coming out of this one. So, you know, I sort of had the operations, the crash, and then this operation to, to uh, recover from. So I'm still here, 99 and going strong. <laughs> Amazing. It's, it's such an honour and privilege for us to be able to hear your story today. So uh, thank, thank you for sharing it. Thank you. Well, that's, yeah. Can I, can I ask you, um, do you have any regrets? You've, you've lived a long time. What, what are any regrets that you might have in your life? Oh... Well, uh, regrets. No, I, I've been damn lucky in my life. I, I've had a all, all through my uh, 
you know, growing up, I was, you know, was a very loving only child and a very loving family and uh, and uh, school and everything was good fun and and that uh, 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 I'm very thankful to, to God for for giving me this life and uh, you know I pray every day that that, that uh, for my family and I thank them because. They're such a loving and wonderful, wonderful people, and and uh, it's it's uh, it's it's just so nice. And the warmth that I have that that is generated with this, you've seen it. It's, the chemistry is pretty strong. Yep, and so yeah, I'm still here. We had the, we had a big bash out at the Connington. Uh, retirement home last week with the birthday and uh, and and Jackie and, and her sister and his and her sister's husband they they organized a fantastic bash which I'm still getting compliments about uh, Trish Jackie uh, and uh, it was it was very heartwarming to, for me to find that the love and, and that that's there with the people. It's, so I'm lucky. I don't have any regrets that I, uh, what I have done, what I have failed to do. No, I, in no sense, I, 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 things have just been good. With uh, with all that's going on in the world right now, uh, with you know, oh yes, the, the terrible things happening overseas, is violence the answer? No, certainly isn't. Love is the answer. Yeah, and I pray for that. Because I do. I, I mean, I, I remember well, this morning I prayed. I prayed for Putin. So, you know, so look at the look on the <laughs> which I did. Look on the funny side. I was and on the squadron. You know, I was I was a bit of the jokester, and and I was always up to. To tricks and everything else, and one example was that uh, we were all under canvas, and uh, but uh, we, we, there, there were four of us that decided we we fought. We had a bridge bridge fall, and we used to play when we weren't flying, and down in the mess booze. I didn't tell you about this one either. Uh, well, anyway, uh, uh, we we uh, we we we'd play bridge, and and. Uh, on this particular occasion, uh, the the this the, the bomber, one of the the bomber guy uh, from the other crew actually, he got a call up to the to to, to the you know, bombing leader, and so he had to go. So we stacked. We just dealt the cards. So then we stacked them, so that uh, when the bidding came, he had a grand slam. He thought because we all he, he, he had one card that was. You know, it was was one. He, he had the king, but not the ace, and and and, and the way we organised the bidding that he thought the ace was on the on his left hand side, not on his right hand side. <laughs> and the other the other thing was that in the air crew sergeant's mess, uh, we uh, we got uh, oh, there's two stories here. Uh, first of all, we didn't get any beer. We got lots of Italian wine, but we got a bottle of beer. It was that big Canadian black horse beer, a big with a big uh, uh, court, you know, whatever it was, bottle. And so we used to save that and stick it under your, the, under your, well, the beds. We didn't have a bed or cot or anything. We had to make them, and uh, uh, no, that's another thing. But then anyway, we put them there, and so. So store them up for when you finish your tour, and then you'd have a big party, and have, you'd have all these bottles of beer that you could, you know, have a really good party with. And so, so uh, on this particular occasion, uh, <laughs> these two guys got shot down over northern Italy, uh, and uh, one of them was one of our wireless operators we trained with, and and this little. Uh, gunner from from England. They bailed out, and these two guys got together 
and they walked all the way down to to uh, the lines, which was then then south of Rome. So they had a long, pretty long walk down down the spine of the of Italy, and uh, they after sort of the Germans want the 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 Indians who who the lines they they struck wanted to shoot them on the spot, but uh, uh, fortunately the British officer uh, had the sense to listen to them and they called group headquarters and found out these guys were really missing and blah, blah, blah. And uh, anyway, they arrived back on the squad, and I'll never forget this, and we said, what the fuck are you guys doing back here? <laughs> you should be, you got knocked off. <laughs> and then, then, uh, this little gunner, he shorty, he was completely pissed off. Where's my beer? Because <laughs> when anybody was went missing, there was a great dive. After you know, when you, you were debriefing, and when you heard it, the mob would go down. The first attempt would get their beer. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And the other thing was that uh, in in our in our uh, mess at night there, if you weren't weren't flying you, 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 and you weren't going to knew you weren't be going to go flying. We'd have a little party down in the air crusaders mess, and after we'd had our few vinos and so forth, we'd uh, we'd line up and then a guy out in the front would stand there and he'd say, "A little one, just in case we lose." <laughs> so we'd all <laughs> so that was that was the front of the thing, yeah. But never had any, you know. It was a, it was a thing, and uh, being on a RAF squadron, uh, and and with the primitive uh, uh, toilet stuff that we had, uh, this fella uh, got a, you know, we used to get a, a fruit cake from mum and dad, and 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 uh, in a tin. So we got nails and bashed holes in and put them on a nice pole like that. Then someone would boil the water down on the, the cook's sort of furnacey thing and uh, then pour it in and you'd have your little shower. And, yeah, and that was, uh, yeah. The, the visit to the, uh, to the uh, Australian War Memorial and uh, they were pushing me around on this wheelchair and uh, we got to the Lancaster bomber, and oh, look, look, look at the bombers. And then all of a sudden there's the sound effects, the flag, the searchlights. I completely lost it, completely. I just went to pieces. And uh, yes, I remember that. I saw the names of these guys, and, and I looked for 1425531, Flight Sergeant McGilvery. And he, he was in 40 Squadron, and he was in the same in Italy, the same as me. But we were mates uh, through training, and then, of course, after we got different crews, we, you know, crewed up with them, but we still kept in touch. And this was in Italy, and uh, I, uh, I, uh, we, we were, we were, our airfield was quite a bit out of Foggia, but this particular, I got, you know, it was, I, Took the lift. I took a hitch the lift into Fodger the other day off, and uh, I thought I'd go and visit Mac. Well, Mac had got the chop the night before. When in 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 our day, it was the thing. That, you know, we we all of us volunteered, and uh, we protected the. We managed to survive, and 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 alone we we saved the country from the tyranny of the Nazi boot. And you know, and that was that. But uh, it was a it was a very interesting journey. That, and uh, as I say afterwards, well, you know, everyone went their own way. And, and but <laughs> there's a book in there that you might I know it back actually, but you might want to see it. It's called Always Ahead, and this Canadian boy. Uh, his father was a bomb aimer on our squadron, and and uh, his father was, I think he was dying, and he wanted to, uh, but Shorty was, was had done military history at, at university, so he, he wanted to uh, 
he you know, said to his father, well, you know, blah, 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 and he, he said, I had an idea I'd like to write a book about you. So he got my name, I was in, in the, down, down in Washington area, and uh, I, I then was able to put him on to a bunch of Australians. Bob Milford, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your story. It was absolutely amazing to hear. I, I know just sitting through and listening to you tell me some of these stories, um, you've, you've been through so much and the passion and the, the commitment that you've had to your education, your career in the military through World War II and then at the back end, you know, becoming so successful, uh, attaining your doctorate and then travelling the world with your family. Uh, it's just a, an amazing story. So thank you for sharing it. I wish you all the best for the future. You're so strong still. You are 99 now. Uh, I hope to be at your 100th birthday next year. Uh, but stay strong and thank you for sharing your story. And I like this cup and if I could nick it, I'd take it. You can, you can have that. Can I? I'll, I'll, I'll nick it for you. Okay. I'll sort it out. <laughs> it's yours. From what you've done for us, okay. you have what you want. <laughs> I couldn't help with Jackie. I'm Jackie. I'm Bob's youngest. I, my, I have an older brother and two older sisters. And um, I was born when Bob was 35. So there'd been a big gap, 10 years between the war and, and life. And um, the stories that I heard about the war when I was growing up were the funny stories, the beer stealing, you know, the, that, those types of stories. It was always humor. Um, which, so it, it wasn't something that I experienced his trauma, but I, there's another part of that, that, that poignantly I remember. And my mother often told the story of when they were first married, that she would get thrown out of bed with him waking up from nightmares, yelling, bail out, bail out. And, and even though as a child, I didn't understand that trauma, um, I knew it was not. It, it, was, it was a consequence of the war that was not a good thing. Um, I, I think that as obviously as I got older and I realized what that was, it, it gave me a um, much, even in much deeper respect for how he coped with humor and with, with friendship, the friendships from the war. And he talked about those friends, not as much when um, I was little, but about, 30 years ago, he and my mother and my eldest took a trip over to the UK and they went to Hendon and saw the Wellington and uh, he remembered those stories and m much to my mother's um, frustration sometimes, he would then start to really tell those stories. And that's when I think that he processed that, that trauma and that grief, the, the opportunity to tell the stories to his grandchildren and his children. and. And really, you know, anyone who would who cared to hear, which, as you've heard, he's a great storyteller. So a lot of people did enjoy hearing that. Um, I, I think that part of what made it possible for him and for many World War II uh, veterans to move on from that were the opportunities that were, they were given when they returned home. Uh, as you heard, he went, he finished his education, he had a career. It's not so easy now, I think, that the, the world climate is different, the economic climate's different, um, and, and just remembering that that trauma's there for so many in the military, um, whether they've actually seen combat or, or they haven't, and the fear is there. Um, even if you don't have that interaction that's so deadly and scary, you still live with the possibility that you might. The other thing that I would like to say is that when we moved around the world, so we lived in South America, but we also traveled a bit in different countries. And um, when we were there, I was, you know, 10 years old or thereabouts. And there was never um, a judgment of other people. Um, we, we were always uh, re reminded that, that the things that we had were, were by the grace of God um, and that other people who were not as economically fortunate or whatever would know were no different than us, that we were never any better than anybody else. 
And it works the other way too, you know, nobody was better than us. So um, that's another gift that they've given to their family um, that has been passed down is, is just to be able to um, meet people on an equal plane. My father is, as you can tell, a very uh, congenial person and loves to share his stories, loves visitors. Um, so if anybody watching this it goes, oh, I'd really like to meet him. I'd really like to, to hear some more about his experiences or just, um, you know, ha have, the, have a visit. The he, he says he, he lives in the slammer. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so um, please don't hesitate if you'd, if you'd like to get to know him a little bit better. He, he, he'd enjoy that very much. Thank you for being the rock of the family. Thank you for loving all of us and, and being such a fine example and um, support to all your children and grandchildren. You know, I know my, my children would not be who they are today if, if you and, and mom had not been there for them, so yeah.